so this is the video lesson for section 4.2. Now 4.3 has a little bit of math in it, so we'll be doing that section together in class. All right, so section 4.1, we kind of talked about, you know, the size of an atom and that type thing, um, just the basics. So today we're going to talk about the parts of the atom. So we're going to be talking about, hopefully you already know, protons, neutrons, and electrons. All right, those are the three subatomic particles of the atom, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So, here's a chart. Now, you may notice that I love to put lists, charts, and pictures as free response questions on my tests. All right, so this is a chart, so make sure that you know it and can fill it in on the test. Okay, so this chart breaks it down into the particle, the symbol that we use for the particle, the charge of the particle, the relative mass, and then where the particle is, the location. So the first one is electron. The symbol is E with a little negative because, of course, the charge is negative 1. So the negative stands for the charge, negative 1. The relative mass of an electron is 1 over 1840, 1,840. However, if you can just remember 1 over 2,000, I will let you round. That's a very large rounding there, okay, but I'll let you round for that. The location is, of course, the electron cloud. Some people say energy levels. Um, anything is fine for that as long as it's outside of the nucleus, okay, because electrons are the ones that are outside of the nucleus. All right, next is proton. The symbol is P plus because, of course, it has a plus one charge, and the relative mass is one, and the location is the nucleus, so the protons are inside of the nucleus. And last is neutrons. Neutrons, the symbol is N with a little zero because the charge is zero. A lot of people want to say negative neutron because they both start with N because protons, positive. But neutron comes from the word neutral. Okay. Um, so neutron is N to the zero because the charge is zero. The relative mass is also one and it is also located in the nucleus. So in other words, for the atom, the proton and neutron are in the nucleus the electrons are around or outside the nucleus in the electron cloud. Now let's talk about this relative mass real quick. These are not the actual masses. Okay, relative mass means we're just going to pick a starting point for the mass. So let's just say we pick that a proton has a mass of 1. That means a neutron also has a mass of 1. What that tells me is a proton and a neutron have pretty much the same mass. On the other hand, an electron has 1 over 1840. Or, like I said, you can just remember 1 over 2,000. What that means is an electron has 1 2,000th the mass, or like it's 2,000 times smaller than a proton or a neutron. So would an electron really affect the mass being so small? No. So later in section 4.3 when we learn about mass of an atom, you'll notice that we only care about proton and neutron. We completely disregard electron because they're so small. Okay, an electron is so small it would be as if you weighed yourself on your bathroom scale and then I hand you a paper clip and say, okay, now weigh yourself and let's see what happens. The scale is not going to change. The paper clip is such a tiny change that the scale is not even going to be able to recognize it. Okay, and so that's what happens with electrons. They are just so much smaller that even when you have a lot of them, it just doesn't really affect the mass. All right, so let's go ahead and click. Next, we're going to talk about you know how, next we're going to talk about how each particle was discovered and who discovered it. The who is the important part. Okay, so J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. All right, electrons are, of course, negatively charged particles that are found around the nucleus in the electron cloud or the energy levels, as we'll call it later. Thompson discovered electrons by studying a cathode ray tube. Um, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like and kind of give you an example to kind of keep an idea in your mind of what a cathode ray tube is. A cathode ray is a glowing beam that travels from a cathode to an anode. All right, so he studied this cathode ray tube, and we'll talk about how he discovered it over the next couple of slides. All right, so J.J. Thompson discovered the electron using the cathode ray tube. <clears throat> so this is a picture of a cathode ray tube. So you can kind of think of it as, you know, the best example I can give you is like a fluorescent light bulb. Long tube, glass, full of a gas, and when you put pass electricity through it, it glows. Okay, the glowing beam is called the cathode ray. Alright, so we have the long tube, we have our cathode and our anode. When electricity is turned on, you get a beam of light across the tube. 
So J.J. Thompson wanted to know, well, what is this beam of light? You know, how does this happen? What is this made of? All right, so what he did was he put a filter so that, that way instead of just being this bright beam of light, he could kind of focus it, kind of like a laser. Okay, so he filtered it so he has this thin beam pass through, and he decided to test it using kind of like magnets, a positive and a negative plate. When you put a positive plate and a negative plate on opposite sides, you can see the beam bent towards the positive plate. So what's attracted to positive? Well, we all know opposites are attract. So if it bent towards the positive plate, that must mean it's made of negative particles. Okay, and that's how he determines that. All right, now I'm gonna show you a real example. It's a video I pulled off of YouTube. It's not very long and there's no talking, but you're just gonna see this setup and you're gonna see a person kind of holding a magnet and you'll see it kind of bend towards the magnet and then they're gonna switch sides of the magnet and then you'll see it bend away. Very, very short, but let's look at that real quick. All right, so here comes the magnet. It's bending towards the magnet. They flip the magnet, it bends away from the magnet. So this is the exact thing that J.J. Thompson saw in his lab when he was determining electrons. Okay, so since it's bending away, of course, they have the negative side of the magnet pointing down at this point. And in the beginning, when it was bending towards, it was the positive side. All right, so let's talk about protons. Okay, so J.J. Thompson discovered electrons using that cathode ray tube and those positive and negative charged plates to see which way it bent. Well, they knew atoms were neutral. Okay, atoms must be neutral, otherwise we would all be attracting to everything. Okay, so that means that they have no overall charge. Well, that means if you have negatives, what do you have to have to balance it out? Well, you have to have positives. Okay, so Eugene Goldstein found evidence for positively charged particles when he found rays traveling in the opposite direction of the cathode ray. So if the cathode ray is traveling one way and it's made of negative particles, if something's going the opposite, then what would it be made of? Positive particles. Okay, so he named these positively charged particles protons. All right, so J.J. Thompson discovered electrons using the cathode ray tube, and then Eugene Goldstein founded protons also using the cathode ray tube. So that's very um, important. The cathode ray tube was used to discover both electrons and protons. All right, so let's look at neutrons. So James Chadwick confirmed the existence of neutrons, and of course those are subatomic particles with no charge. So the way you can remember that is the nickname for James is Jimmy and Jimmy Neutron. So if you all remember James, discovered neutrons. Actually, they call him James Isaac Neutron sometimes in uh, the car tape if you've ever seen it before. Um, so James Chadwick discovered neutrons. All right, so J.J. Thompson was electrons, Eugene Goldstein was protons, and James Chadwick was neutrons. Make sure you know those people. Dates are not important. Where they're from is not important. It's the names that are important. All right, so let's start talking about some of the models of the atom because where we left off was really Democritus and Dalton where they're just kind of like atoms are indivisible, there are different types of atoms, but that's about all we got to. So eventually they tried to make models for the atoms. So when J.J. Thompson discovered electrons, he decided he needed to update the model of the atom. And so he came up with what he called the plum pudding model. So in the plum pudding model, he knew that atoms must be neutral. So once he discovered those negative particles, he knew there had to be something positive. So instead of saying, you know, protons, he decided that it was kind of like, think of it like in, you know, like superhero movies where they make like this big ball of like a force field. He thought there was kind of like this big ball of positive force field energy and the electrons were kind of dispersed throughout. He called it plum pudding model because in Europe, a lot of people eat plum pudding, and so that was a common dessert, so everybody would know what he's talking about. Now, we all eat chocolate chip cookies, so I like to focus on that. So the cookie would be the big positive part, and then all of those little chocolate chips would be your negative electrons, okay? And it's called plum pudding model, and this was by J.J. Thompson, okay, once he discovered the electron. So that's the model that he determined. However, in science, can't just say, oh, by the way, I think this is what something looks like. People are going to test it. So Ernest Rutherford decided to test the plum pudding model to see if it was accurate. So again, I have a short video clip. I'll go ahead and tell you there is a heavy accent, but the video clip is good. Um, we'll watch that real quick, and then I'll go through and kind of break down the video for you. Yeah. 
Abbefold's alpha scattering experiment. The credit for the discovery of the nucleus of an atom goes to a British physicist, Lord Ernest Rutherford. Shown here is the diagrammatic view of the famous gold foil experiment conducted by Lord Rutherford. The radioactive source rich in alpha particles was kept in a thick lead block with a narrow opening. The alpha particles were confined to a narrow beam by passing them through a lead sheet with a slit. An extremely thin foil of gold was bombarded with these fast-moving alpha particles. The scattered alpha particles were detected using a rotatable detector which has a microscope and a screen coated with zinc sulfide. The whole experimental setup was placed in an evacuated chamber to prevent scattering by the air molecules. These striking particles caused scintillations on the screen. Based on the observations, Lord Rutherford deduced these conclusions. As most of the alpha particles pass through the gold foil without any deflection, most of the space within the atoms is empty. As some of the alpha particles were deflected by large angles, they must have approached some positively charged region responsible for the deflection. This positively charged region is called the nucleus. As very few alpha particles experienced the deflection, it was concluded that the volume occupied by the nucleus is very small. Since alpha particles, which are comparatively denser, were deflected by the nucleus, it shows that almost the complete mass of the atom must be within the nucleus. Okay, so that video, it kind of showed us the setup and the, you know, conclusions that Rutherford determined based on his experiment. Okay, so let's kind of go back over them together. So Rutherford decided to test plum pudding model. He wanted to see, is that model accurate? So he decided to shoot alpha particles. Alpha particles come from radioactive decay, um, and they are just helium atoms with no electrons. So in other words, they have a double positive charge and he shot those at a thin sheet of gold foil. The particles should have passed through the foil with slight deflection. So in other words, when those double positive alpha particles hit that positive force field, if plum pudding model had been correct, then they kind of would have deflected a little bit. By that, it kind of passed through, but they bend a little bit, so it wouldn't keep going straight. It kind of just bends, you know, out each way because it would have kind of had its path thrown off a little bit by that positive force field. However, that's not what happened. Okay, a few of them did that, but most of them did not. Most of the alpha particles actually passed straight through. So if they passed straight through, what did they hit? Well, they obviously didn't hit anything. All right, some of them did deflect, and then some of them actually hit the gold foil and bounced back. Now they say that this um, evidence right here, this data of the particles bouncing back was so surprising that it would be as if you shot a cannonball at tissue paper and then it bounced back. That's how sure they were that there is no reason that the alpha particles should ever bounce back. So once your data doesn't go with your hypothesis, you have to come up with something else. So it obviously shows plum pudding model was not accurate because what they thought was going to happen did not. So, of course, that means he needs to come up with some more conclusions. So, just to remind you, this was the setup. So, we had a source of alpha particles. And remember, alpha particles just come from radioactive decay. So, the alpha particles were focused towards the thin sheet of gold foil. And remember, he had this um, screen that would scintillate with zinc sulfide uh, when it's hit by the alpha particles. So, if you look, most of them pass straight through. See how this line is thicker than all the rest? Some of them did deflect, which was, you know, expected, and then a few of them actually bounced back, which, as I said, was completely unexpected. So, we got to figure out why this happened. So, since most of them just passed straight through, they obviously hit nothing. So, Rutherford proposed that the atom is mostly empty space, thus explaining the lack of deflection of most of the particles. They clearly just passed straight through, didn't hit anything. 
He also concluded that all of the positive charge and most of the mass are concentrated in a small region that has a positive charge called the nucleus. Those that hit and actually bounced back that was so shocking, that's because they didn't consider that there was a dense positive nucleus in the center. They thought it was kind of this positive force field. So once you change it to a dense positive nucleus, it makes sense. The two hit, they bounce back. All right, and so remember, he's credited with discovering the nucleus. And then remember, the nucleus is the tiny central core of an atom, and it's composed of protons and neutrons. Remember, the electrons are in the electron cloud outside. So he came up with the fact that the atom is mostly empty space, and he discovered the nucleus. So let's look at an atomic level, what was actually happening. Okay, so these are the gold atoms. You have the nucleus, and then you have the electron cloud. So for all those alpha particles that pass straight through, notice they just didn't hit anything. They just cruise through that electron cloud. That's it. Okay, for the ones that bounce back, they hit that nucleus dead on. It was like bam, and then they bounce right back. So see this one bounced back, this one bounced back, and this one bounced back. But what about those ones that deflected? Well, I mean, they don't have to hit the nucleus dead on. What if they just skim the side of it? Okay, and that's what happened to those. It kind of skimmed the side and then it kind of deflected from its path that way. All right, so this is at the atomic level what's happening. The ones that hit nothing pass straight through. The ones that hit the nucleus dead on bounce back. And then the ones that kind of deflected just kind of skimmed the side of the nucleus. Well, once you determine someone else's model is incorrect, what do you do? Well, you make up your own model. All right, so plum pudding model was determined to not be correct by Rutherford, so Rutherford came up with his own model, and he called it, surprise, surprise, Rutherford's model. So in the nuclear atom, or Rutherford's atom, the protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus. And for most people, if I had you draw an atom before you ever had my class, most people would draw something similar to Rutherford's. That's the one that most people kind of visualize in their mind. Some of my students call this the Jimmy Neutron atom because it looks like the atom that's in Jimmy Neutron. Um, this is called Rutherford's model. And then the electrons, of course, are distributed around the outside, and they occupy most of the volume. So the nucleus is very tiny in the center, but it has all the mass. The electron cloud is very large, and it has all the volume. Okay, so nucleus, tiny, that has all the mass. Electron cloud, large, and has all the volume. Okay, and that is Rutherford's model. So let's knock out this section assessment real quick. So, what are the three types of subatomic particles? Well, hopefully you could answer that before you took my class. And that is proton, neutron, and electron. I'm using the abbreviations because now we know this. So, P plus, N to the zero, and E negative. So, how does the Rutherford model describe the structure of the atoms? Well, it has the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons in the electron cloud. All right, so protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Electrons are in the electron cloud. And again, I'm using our abbreviations. Once you know an abbreviation, you'll find I don't really write out words anymore. Okay, so P positive in a zero, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. E negative is electrons are in the electron cloud. All right, so what are the charges and relative masses of the three main subatomic particles? Okay, well, we have protons, neutrons, electrons. Well, the charge is given away in the symbol, but we'll still write it. The charge of a proton is plus one, a neutron zero, and an electron is negative one. And then what are the relative masses? Okay, remember, the proton is one, the neutron is also one, because they have about the same mass, but what was the electron? It was one over 1840. Or I told you, you could remember one over 2000. So in other words, electrons are much, much, much smaller than in mass than a proton and a neutron. And that's why their mass is not really uh, doesn't really matter in the overall mass of the atom. All right, so compare Rutherford's expected outcome with the actual outcome. So remember, his expected, I'm going to write the expected up here so I can put the little error. His expected outcome was the alpha particles, so we'll just say particles, particles would pass through with deflection. So remember, they would pass through the gold foil, but they would bend their pathway. If deflection throws you off, just change that to bend. Like it would bend as it passed through. But what actually happens, so the actual outcome is one most passed straight through. 
Okay, so they just went straight through. They didn't deflect at all. Two, some did deflect. Some actually bounced back. And remember y'all, I know that you can't seem to understand how shocking that is. But like I said, could you imagine if I set up a cannonball, shot it at tissue paper and it bounced back? And that would be pretty, pretty shocking. Some actually bounced back. All right, so remember, he thought that they would pass through, and when they passed through that positive force field of the plum pudding model, they would kind of bend in their pathway or deflect. But what actually happened is most passed straight through because they didn't hit anything. Some did deflect because they kind of skimmed the side of that nucleus, and then some actually hit the nucleus dead on and bounced back. All right, so I'm going to erase this, and let's go to the last of the section assessment. So what experimental evidence led Rutherford to conclude that the atom was mostly empty space? Well, remember, he had three pieces of evidence. He had that they passed straight through, he had that they deflected, and he had that they bounced back. So which of those would show that the atom is mostly empty space? Well, the one where they passed straight through. So most particles passed straight through. Sorry, it's kind of sloppy. I'm trying to write that. Most of the particles passed straight through. So that's the evidence he had that most of the atom was empty space. Because clearly they didn't hit anything if they passed straight through. And the last one. How did Rutherford's model of the atom differ from Thompson's plum pudding model? Well, the easiest way to answer this would, of course, just be to draw them. You're going to need to know how to draw them anyway on my test. I like lists, charts, which we had one of those today, and pictures, which we had two of those today. So let's just draw them. All right, so Thompson's plum pudding model looks a little bit like this. Remember, it's like a chocolate chip cookie. So you have a big positive area. So this whole area is like a positive force field. And then you have electrons throughout, just like a chocolate chip cookie. On the other hand, Rutherford's model has a nucleus. Okay, so we have a positive nucleus. Remember, the nucleus contains the protons and the neutron. And then your electrons are just kind of outside the nucleus. He wasn't real sure where they are. We'll get to that later. Okay, he wasn't real sure where the electrons were. He just knew that they were somewhere outside of the nucleus. And so really our next couple of models, we got the nucleus down. We're focusing on where are the electrons besides just saying, oh, they're somewhere out there. All right, so that's 4.2. Like I said, 4.3 we'll be covering in class.